is up everybody it is alex from heavy new york calling from the quarantine zone again and this time we return with colby of Wormwitch. great to be able to talk with you man i think you're the only band so far where i've interviewed on every single album cycle so yeah it's cool that uh it's cool that we have that history yeah you were it's, one of the uh, you're sorry, sorry go ahead no it's just that that tour that you did with Black Dahlia Murder and Suffocation, I mean, it feels like a lifetime ago at this point. I can't believe it's been four years. You were one of the first interviews that we ever – I think you were like our seventh interview or something like that. Mm. It does – it feels like a long time ago, but also it feels like yesterday in certain ways. Yeah, yeah. Good times though. That was a really, really good time and uh, glad to be able to catch up with you. I'm glad that you guys are still killing it because we got the new album Wolf Hex coming out very soon. Do you consider this just a follow-up to Heaven Dwells? Do you think that this is almost kind of like a continuation of that, or are you taking a new start for Wormwitch in a way? Uh, I definitely do not think it's a continuation. I think it is a new start, but I'm starting to feel like that's kind of how we approach every album. Um, we kind of start every album with an idea that we're excited about, and that kind of takes us in a new direction, and that's what fuels us and inspires us to actually make the record. Uh, so yeah, this one, we definitely had a different approach to writing and recording and the whole thing. And it's, it felt fresh and great and fun. Uh, yeah. Was there like, because you're right in a way, cause I've noticed that there has been like an evolution between strike mortal soil to heaven that dwells within to now, like, does it ever start off with a preconceived idea and how you and the band want it to sound like, or is there like almost a lot of improvising or trial and error involved? Um, it's, it does start with an idea in the past. It's, it's been very much, uh, we'd come together, make a record and we would discuss what we wanted it to sound like. We'd have the idea before we ever started like playing guitar and writing the riffs themselves. Um, so yeah, I, like it's, it's kind of, sometimes it's not even entirely verbal. It's just kind of understanding that we have as the direction we want to go in. Um, but we're kind of moving a little bit away from that in that we're trying to be more instinctual and kind of follow our intuition more and maybe let things come out how they come out. I think that honestly, that was probably a bit of why Wolf Hex is the way the Wolf Hex is in terms of the, what it just sounds different. Um, it's, uh, it was, I think a little more, uh, I don't know, we shot from the hip. It was a little less uh, contrived, I guess. Yeah. Well, I thought that Heaven That Dwells Within, I loved that album because, like, it almost kind of had, like, a retrospective of, like, classic black metal combined with, like, uh, more, like, post-black metal. Like, it was almost kind of like Emperor meets Agaloc in a way. Mm. So, like, it, yeah. it kind of had that vibe behind it. I love the melody and the atmosphere that was in that. Please tell me that there's some remnants of Heaven That Dwells Within in Wolf Hex. For sure. It, it definitely is. I think that there's a, a similarity that continues through everything that we've done, but we just approach it differently every time. Um, the influences and like the bands that we take influence from, the kind of stuff that we look at for influence form, which uh, has, has not really changed that much over the course of the band's existence. Yeah. Uh, but we just have a different approach to songwriting every time. Well, being that you guys are from Vancouver, which, you know, it's the, you know, the neighbors of, uh, you know, Seattle and Portland, Oregon, which is like the, I mean, I feel like that whole region upward is like just the doom capital of the universe in a way with the Yobs and the Agaloks and the Bell Witches and so many other like insane bands. Like does, does region play a role in a way as well? Uh, it probably plays a role. I think it plays a role. There's a Cascadian sound, I feel like, that bands have despite their actual style or genre. Um, I don't know, the atmosphere of this part of the world and the just the the way that the the nature is here uh, affects the bands that that live here. Yeah, there's and, yeah, inspires us simil similarly despite the differences in style. Well, what I find so fascinating about the Cascadian region is like, you know, Seattle and Portland and, you know, Vancouver, like are all amazing cities, but like the most beautiful essence of nature surrounds it. So like, I feel like you have like both a really uh, urban and very uh, rural sort of influence in a way. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, we all kind of grew up outside of the city and have moved to the city in recent years for the sake of being part of the music scene and work and that kind of thing. So uh, we've experienced both sides of that. Yeah. It all builds into what we what we put out. Yeah. In terms of your influences, and I know artists kind of like hate this question as much as I do as well, but like in terms of your influences in a way, like because I feel like you have a bridge between like a black metal sound and a death metal sound and you sort of have that crust sort of influence as well. Does everybody in the band have like different inspirations in a way? Or do you all kind of have like one little uh, or one artist that you all hold very tight that directly influences Wormwitch? Uh, I'd say we probably all take influence from different stuff. Um, Wormwitch has always kind of been a melting pot of influences for all of us, I feel like. Like, um, it's it's the kind of center point of all the stuff that we're interested in. So uh, the bands that inspire us the most as individuals are going to, it's going to become what the band ends up sounding like. So, yeah. Yeah. I'd say, uh, yeah. Yeah. In terms of like the lyrical inspiration as well, because I've always thought that like the album titles are very distinct from each other as well. Like I thought that Strike More to Soil was like, I mean, if I didn't know who the band was, I would have thought that that was almost kind of like a thrash metal record just by that title in a way. And then, you know, Heaven mm. That Dwells Within is so mysterious and so like open to interpretation. And now with Wolf Hex, it almost seems like... Um, it almost seems like that there's like a ritualistic aspect behind it as well. Is there like a outside, is there inspiration outside of music that you cite as well for your music? Like, are you looking at elements of literature or do you cite personal experiences for the lyricism in the music as well? Uh, yeah, I don't personally write any lyrics. That's, uh, that's almost entirely Robin's department. But uh, yeah, it's definitely influenced by the stuff we're reading and the philosophy and the spiritual stuff that we're into as well. What, what have you been reading throughout this pandemic? Because I don't know about you, but I was just a chronic bookworm for the last 20 months. Mm -hmm. um, what have I gotten through this pandemic? I'm, right now I'm in the middle of Dune for the first time. I'm super just into Dune. Um, it's my first time reading. I don't know if you're familiar with Dune at all. Uh, um, I'm not like a, a huge sci-fi guy generally, but I'm I'm really loving Dune, and I'm, it's my first time reading it, and I'm super into the, the world. Yeah, I mean, I've been reading a lot of history. I, I was a history nerd, so I'm just reading all about like art history and you know uh, spiritual entities. I actually uh, read a little bit of Anton Lavey's uh, Ministry. <clears throat> I just uh, finished a uh, uh, bio. It's um. I'm blanking on his name now. It's uh, I have it on my shelf over there. I'm trying to see it. Uh, it's uh, Ma Magic Rock and Roll and the Wickedest Man in the World by. Uh, it's a bio about Anton. Le or um, see, I'm thinking Alistair Crowley. It's a bio about Alistair Crowley, but I uh, I have the Satanic Bible on the shelf over there too. Oh, awesome! Have you read the whole thing? Not entirely. I've I've, I've flipped through it, but I haven't quite crushed it yet. Yeah. It's, it's actually very interesting. I mean, I've interviewed so many black metal bands through this time of chronic isolation and uncertainty that it just made me 10 times more cult. <laughs> yeah, that's, it tends to happen. Yeah. Has, and I, this question is kind of cliche now to ask at this point, but with Wolf Hex, because, you know, between 2019 and now, it's fair to say that the world has taken kind of a drastic turn. I mean, has this time of isolation and uncertainty maybe also influenced the songwriting for Wolf Hex? Um, I'm sure it has in a way that I don't quite understand yet. Um, but it's definitely given us a time of, of like stepping away from touring and stepping away from, I guess, the hustle aspect, the business aspect of music, uh, and forced us to focus on songwriting and given us a better relationship with the band as a whole, I think. Yeah. Isolation. So it's been up there. Yeah. Yeah. Isolation so. is a great fuel for creativity as well. So. Mm. Yeah, I agree for sure. Yeah, has do you prefer to come up with new ideas for the band when you're more like alone in isolation and there's nothing between you and your instrumentation, or do you prefer to be in the company of your other bandmates when it comes to brainstorming ideas? In the past, it's been much more um, isolated. It's been a lot more. Everybody kind of comes up with an idea on their own and brings it to the table, and everyone kind of uh, follows suit with the idea that was originally came from one person in isolation. 
but uh, Wolf Hex has gone more in the direction of writing together as a band and uh, and every, having a collective songwriting process less than a, than a isolated one. And that's kind of the direction we're going in with new stuff too. We've been writing recently and uh, we're, we've been writing just as a band in the jam space, which has been great. So that's, the, that's kind of what we're moving towards. Is it fair to say then that Wolf Hex is a little bit more organic? Definitely, that's a hundred percent what we wanted, and that's uh, that's I think we accomplished it. And uh, for the the next question I have, because uh, I always have usual questions that I ask just about every artist, regardless of what style. This is the first new regular question that I'm going to be asking. You're the first one I'm asking this to. But with every record, because you know there's a famous saying that the more you do something, the easier it gets. But at the same time, it's sometimes hard to cultivate new ideas, especially when you're making albums, you know, every two years or something like that. Do you find it easier to make a record every time, or is it more challenging to make a record every time? I think we're, I think we're getting better at it. I think it's easier, because I think that we understand how we work better every time. We, then we cut the fat, and we skip the stuff that uh, we don't need to be doing, and I don't know, we learn from our mistakes. Yeah. Because, like, I'd imagine, too, does it sometimes get hard? Like, do you find yourself writing a song and then you realize that it is almost kind of like rehashing a riff from a previous song in a way? Like, are you ever, is it, simply put, are you ever worried that a Wormwitch song could sound too much like a Wormwitch song? Uh, if that happens, sometimes that'll kind of happen when we're writing, and I don't know if it's actually made it to the record in a way that's noticeable. But when that kind of thing happens, we just kind of think it's funny. We don't really worry about it too much. Um, if we play a riff again in a song and it's the exact same, it's just a cool way to to uh, use a riff that we already wrote. Uh, I don't know. It seems like uh, something that we're not really afraid of. And another question I have for you is um, because I've seen Wormwitch now. I saw you on the Black Dahlia Suppo tour, but I also saw you on that tour with that band with two letters in their name. I forgot what they're called. When I... Un. Un, yeah. And yes. the fact that I had a hard time remembering that name is pretty bad. But um, like, uh, <laughs> but because when I saw you on the Black Dahlia tour, you know, you were playing like, you know, I don't want to say arenas, but, you know, you were playing like, you know, bigger venues. There's barricades. There's, you know, stricter security. But, you know, I know that on the Untour, you're playing more like underground, crusty clubs in a way. Do, would you say that sometimes the live presence of Wormwich uh, can differ depending on the size of venue it is? Because I got different vibes from, you know, when, when you're on the Untour, I was like legit like standing like a foot in front of you. But on the mm -hmm. Black Dahlia Tour, you know, I'm getting hit with the barricade. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely a different experience. It's kind of hard to say which I prefer as a as the guy on stage. We haven't really done a whole lot of tours where it was like big theaters and small arenas and that kind of thing. It's been mostly the kind of venues that you've seen us that you saw us at on. Uh, so I guess that's kind of what we're more comfortable with, to be honest. But it's always it always kind of there's a different vibe when you get to play on a really big stage, and it's fun in a different way. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure it's also a very different experience as the audience member. Yeah. Well, what's funny is uh, you've heard of that new hardcore band Vein, right? Uh, yes, I'm not super familiar with that. Okay. Well, but I've, I've heard of them. Well, there is like modern hardcore as it gets, most violent, you know, crazy shows possible. I've seen them play at like big venues with like Kill Switch Engage or Code Orange, you know, like Live Nation, you know, barric barricades, security guards everywhere. Like, you know, you can't be within like 10 feet of the band. But I've also mm -hmm. seen them at like underground DIY clubs and like, you know, where everybody is on the stage at the same time. And I'm like curious, like when you yeah. play at a bigger venue, does that almost hinder the connection that a music lover has with the artist? Uh, it definitely hinders the connection in a way, but it also kind of has a different kind of elevating experience to it. Um, but like when it comes to Vane and Code Orange and that kind of thing, I feel like really hardcore based stuff like even like those bands are kind of metal bands but um also very much hardcore bands that kind of thing i think it's much more important to be in like a really intimate setting with the band and have that. like small venues are are the way to go for that kind of thing a barricade and distance between band and audience just kind of kills something with that kind of stuff but um like metal 
traditionally or like just kind of the spirit of traditional metal is more theatrical and cinematic and it kind of uh benefits from being up on a stage a little bit yeah um so yeah i don't know there's pros and cons to each i've always like idolized bands when i've seen them on big stages and growing up listening to bands and, and wanting to be in a band uh, i always wanted to play on big stages because it just feels cool Definitely. but at the same time uh the energy will never be the same well because i've always and this could just be my interpretation of it because i've made art like i've painted listening to wormwitch albums before and like you know i do get like a vision when i hear your music in a way now this could just be me interpreting your music but do you can you see maybe wormwitch like expressing yourselves through other mediums as well through like more visual art and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh yeah well robin has done the artwork for a bunch of our recent stuff so uh the visual aspect is something that he definitely works on and and more of which is a visual project to him in a lot of ways. Uh, we also did all the videos, or, or not all of them, we did two of the videos ourselves for this record. Uh, and those are mostly kind of directed and edited by me. Uh, and I just really enjoy cinema and film and making videos is something that I enjoy doing. So that's a visual aspect of the band that I've been expressing myself with for sure. Yeah. It's, I've noticed there's a there's a black metal band I think they're from, they're from the south somewhere but a black metal band called cloak uh, that's really good Cloak, we've toured with cloak cloak are friends of ours oh they're really awesome yeah they edit their music mm -hmm. videos as well and uh, so it's really I love it when a band is doing more than just the music but like has like visual directions that they have because to yeah. me it doesn't become just a band anymore but it becomes like a mini artistic movement in a way yeah we love that kind of thing too because it's like uh, I don't know. It's 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 cool to be able to have it like we have a band that has a certain uh, aesthetic quality and style and emotional quality that we uh, understand now. We've been doing it long enough and we kind of know what Worm Witch feels like and what we want it to feel like. Uh, so if we can make other kinds of art that express that same feeling, uh, we can still call it Worm Witch and release it under the same yeah. banner. If you don't mind me asking, and I don't know if maybe this is a question for you or Robin, but the girl on the album artwork for Heaven That Dwells Within, who is that? Because I was saying that that could be like the black metal version of the girl from Around the Fur by Deftones in a way, like having that same sort of icon, iconic sort of feeling in a way. Uh, that's a painting called The Lady of Shalott by uh, John William Waterhouse. Oh, okay. I'm getting the name right. Um, yeah, it's a painting that uh, we had in mind for a long time to use for that record, and it ended up being the one. Just uh, the, the the painting suited the the feeling that we wanted the record to express. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, my favorite black metal band, Life Lover, um, but their first album had like a sort of similar icon like that of a figure, and it's really cool when like, I've always noticed with album covers when there's like a person on it, it just makes it so much more interesting. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thought. I'm gonna I'm gonna look for that in album covers that I connect with. If there's a human face, because seeing a human face is always like a yeah, you you connect with it on a on a primal level immediately. Yeah, I think that's why one of the reasons why that Evanescence album, uh, that debut album, Fallen, was so big because like it just you just have Amy Lee staring at you right in the face, and it just instantly gravitates you but if you want to look up an interesting black metal album look up the album pulver by life lover okay i will yeah i've uh, life lover i've listened to them at some point but i've uh i've never given a good album a, a listen to yeah, their whole catalog is my favorite kim carlson is by far like my favorite musician in that style um and uh, the final question I wanted to ask you is kind of going back to Wolf Hex, ending it with a little bit more promotional stuff. But you released three singles on it so far, Hammer of the Underworld, The Wolves of Azeroy, and uh, another single that I cannot uh, – oh, Abracadabra, right? That's how you say it? I can't – Yeah. That's, that word is a dyslexic nightmare. But, um, <laughs> but uh, do you feel that these first three singles are maybe a good representation of what the entirety of Wolf Hex will sound like? Or is there a lot more to be heard? And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I think they're a good summary of the album. I think that that's why those we chose those three singles to represent the album uh, before it comes out. Uh, yeah, 
I'd say that that is a good representation of what the record sounds like, but there's definitely some surprises for sure. Oh, great. Some ballads? Uh, I don't know about ballads. There's a folk, there's a very folky song. Okay. So no, yeah. nothing like Sweet Child of Mine? Nothing like Sweet Child of Mine. Okay, good. As, sure. as somebody who worked on guitar floors, I could go the rest of my life without hearing that song. So anyway, um, before we go, uh, is there just uh, anything else with Wormwich that uh, you would like to promote? Obviously, you know, thanks to this fucking virus that shall not be named, obviously, you know, uh, tours are still up in the air at the moment, but uh, can we be seeing Wormwich on the road fairly soon? Uh, we have nothing booked right now. We're mostly just focusing on the record, promoting the record, and we're also writing some new stuff. But uh, all we have really to promote right now is the new album coming out August 27th. August 27th. Well, Colby, yeah. great to be able to talk with you again, man. Thanks uh, for returning a familiar face from the beginning of Heavy New York. Everybody, we are here with awesome. Colby of Wormwich. Be sure to check out Wolf Hex coming out August 27th via Prosthetic Records. This is Alex from Heavy New York. We will see you next time.